This episode of All In with Pastor Jordan Easley has been made possible by the generous support of viewers like you. Welcome to All In with Pastor Jordan Easley. Today's message is about to begin, and we invite you to prepare your heart and mind to hear an inspiring message from God's Word. We hope and pray for God to speak to you today as you seek to live your life all in for Jesus Christ. And now, from First Baptist Church in Cleveland, Tennessee, here is Pastor Jordan Easley. We are right in the middle of a series uh, going through the book of Ephesians. We're going verse by verse through this incredible letter uh, that Paul wrote to the believers in Ephesus a long time ago. And it's awesome that the letter that he wrote them applies to us today. So we're walking through this text and we're asking the question, who am I? Uh, and apparently, I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. And so that's what we're doing. We're going to the I am and attempt to answer that question. Uh, and it's pretty awesome because as we've seen so far, as Paul wrote the believers in Ephesus almost 2,000 years ago, he tells us if we are in Christ, then we're a saint. We are blessed by God. He tells us that we are, are called by God. And today he's going to show us as we launch into chapter 2, that if that's true about us, then we have been saved by God. If you've been saved, you know it today. And if you've been saved, you're grateful for your salvation. Uh, but you know that term saved, it really does mess some people up. It can be a confusing term to a lot of people. Uh, for instance, I've asked people throughout the years, has Jesus saved you? I even had one person ask me, has Jesus saved me from what? I mean, they didn't understand this idea of being saved. And really, they initially couldn't even see their need for salvation. Hey, here's something I've discovered over the years. Your desire to be found increases dramatically once you've realized that you're lost. Have you ever been lost before? All the men in the room are like, no, never. Awesome. <laughs> if you've ever been lost, your desire to be found increases dramatically. And in the same way, when you realize that you're, that you're lost and your desire to be saved increases dramatically. Listen, when I know that I'm in need of a salvation, that's when I really step in and I say, okay, God, what's it going to take for me to be saved? Uh, the first time I ever realized I needed to be saved was when I was a little bitty boy. I don't know. I was probably nine or 10 years old. And not necessarily in a spiritual sense, it was more in a physical sense. Many of you have been in those situations before as well. My family was spending a, a summer Saturday in Texas at the lake, and, and we, like many of your families, were just enjoying the time on the water. This particular scene had a, a beach where people would hang out, and about 100 yards off the beach was this man-made floating structure where people would swim back and forth, and, and kids primarily would go out to this floating structure, and they would jump and bounce on it, and they would dive off, and then they would swim back to the beach. And really, that's what I had been doing all morning long. I was worn out, apparently, because on one journey, as I was swimming back and forth, my body just stopped working. And if you've ever been in the water before where your body locked up and now your, your legs won't kick and your arms feel like they weigh 500 pounds and, and I was just struggling and really it was a terrifying scene. I don't know if you've been there before, but, but, but it is, it's scary to think like I can't save myself in this moment. I can remember my head going under the water and, and, and taking on water and, and doing everything I can to stay afloat. I'm gasping for air. And at one point, I can remember thinking, man, this is it. I can't do anything in this moment. I am going to drown. And I can remember hearing the screams of somebody else. Now I realize those screams were coming from my little brother, who was just a kid at the time. And he was swimming out to save me. And, and at the same time, he's yelling back to the adults, hoping that one of them can save me as well. And, and in that moment, I just realized for the very first time in my life, that if someone doesn't come to my rescue, th then I'm in trouble. Have you ever been there before physically? Maybe you've not been there physically before, but, but I can tell you right now, if you're alive and your heart is beating, you've probably been there spiritually. You see, as we read the Bible, we see that when we were born, and I think most of us have been born in this place today, right? I think when we're born... Paul's going to tell us that you were born in need of salvation. 
You were born with a need in your life to be saved. And when people say, why do I need to be saved? Paul's going to answer this question in the very first verse of chapter 2. He's going to tell you, you need to be saved. You have a need for salvation because when you were born, you were born dead. Look at verse 1. He said, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. If you're taking notes today, you've got to jot this one down as we kick off chapter 2. We were born dead in our sin. And the reason that we were born dead in our sin, it really goes back to our sin nature. Remember, when we were born, we were born with a sinful nature. And Paul shows us that we were dead because of that nature. He said, your sin nature led you to two things. What does he say? It led you to trespasses and it led you to sins. So, so if those are the destination, what does that mean? Well, that word trespasses, or perhaps it uses the word transgressions in your Bible. That, that word, it, it talks about us getting out of bounds with God. You know that word trespasses from like trespassing, right? That's when you find yourself in a place that you are not supposed to be. And so that word gives us the picture of somebody making false steps and taking the wrong path in life instead of taking the path that God intended for you to take. The other word that he uses here is the word sins. And that's a word that implies that you and I, we miss the mark. And we chose to do things that go against God's design and goes against God's desire for our lives. And Paul says, because we've taken those missteps, because we've taken our own path, we've trespassed against God, and because we've sinned against him, then you and I were born dead. And the cause of your death was sin. He said, your sin killed you. Your trespasses against God sentenced you to death. Verse one, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all, all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath as the others were also. As we walk through these te this text, I, I want to show you beginning in verse one that Paul uses the word dead here to talk about their spiritual state. And then you get to verse two and he talks about the way they used to live. Do you see that? It says the way they previously walked. In other words, he's explaining here how dead people live, how dead people live out their dead state right here on planet earth. So you ask the question, how can you tell if someone is spiritually dead or not? Well, Paul would say, then there are people that live according to the ways of the world and there are people that live according to their fleshly desires. And I may be speaking to someone today, even someone in church, that as you take a personal inventory of your own heart spiritually, you would have to admit, I am spiritually dead because I live my life according to the ways of the world. I live my life according to their flesh, my fleshly desires. And I've never been changed by Jesus. He's never done a work in me to, to make me a new creation in Christ. I can't say today that he has revolutionized the way I think and how I respond to those enticements from the devil. Let me just tell you something. If you're spiritually dead today, the devil's goal for your life is for you to remain lifeless. That's his goal. I mean, I have this picture in my mind going back to my previous illustration. I can just imagine the moment where I'm in the water and I'm about to drown. And here's the picture I want you to see with me today. Just imagine going under the water on one side of the beach. You have God sprinting to you, doing everything he can to pursue you and help you and to save you. But on the other side of the beach, you have the devil and he's standing there looking, pointing at you and laughing. That's exactly what he wants for your life. His goal has always been to what? To steal and to kill and to destroy. And since the moment you were born, he's had a plan to accomplish his goals in your journey. This passage of scripture is almost written like one of those diet commercials that gives you like a before and after picture. You got the first three verses and he's like, hey, this is who you used to be. You used to be way out of shape. You were in bad shape, right? You, this is who you used to be. I want you to look at this picture. You were dead in your trespasses and your sin. But then you get to verse four and he's like, but this is who you are now. 
He said, and God is the one who gets the glory. Verse four says, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. He said, you are saved by grace. You ask the question, how does a person go from being dead in sin to being alive in Christ? You know, you know what the answer is, right? It's God. That's the only answer. How does a person go from death to life? It's God. This says you were dead, you were in the world, you were far from God. But then in verse four, it says, but God. That's a great, a great pair of words. He said, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love made us alive with Christ. He said, you are saved by grace. Don't miss this today. God is the only one who can bring dead things to life. You know how he's described in the book of Romans? He's described as the one who gives life to the dead and calls things into existence that do not exist. In the very beginning, go to the first page of your Bible. God created everything out of nothing. It's the words ex nihilo. And that sense of creation, it didn't stop in the book of Genesis. I want you to see that creator God is still creating today. He's still creating new things. He's still creating new people. He's still creating new lives and new stories. It's, it's a beautiful thing. And you know what? He does it in such a way where only he can get the credit. Where only God can get the glory. He designed it that way. In Psalm 23, 3, he says, he renews my life. He leads me along the right paths. Why? For his name's sake. You may have wondered, why has Jesus saved me? Why did he forgive me of, his sin, of my sins? Why has he given me new life in Christ? Can I answer it? For his name's sake. He said in Isaiah 48, 11, for my own sake, indeed my own, I will not give my glory to another. Maybe you've never even thought about that. Maybe you thought salvation was all about us. Listen, salvation is primarily all about him. When God saves us, he does it for his name's sake. Only God can do what God has done for us. And when he does it, he says it's for his glory. Get this today. The life that we have in Christ can only occur by his grace. We've got to remember God saves us and gives us life for his glory. I mean, the fact that, that you were dead in your sin and you're now alive in Christ, this story and your story is intended to, to bring God glory. So keep that as the baseline. But not only should your testimony give glory to God in your life and through your life on planet earth, but the Bible just said that he wants to display this act of grace and kindness in the coming ages as well. Verse eight's my favorite. It says, for you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift not from works so that no one can boast for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. That word grace, it's mentioned three different times in the past five verses. And you may wonder why it's because it's God's primary motive for bringing us life. The Bible says that I am saved by grace. You are saved by grace. The question is, what is grace? I heard one author define grace like this. He said, it's to be delivered from the righteous judgment of God through no act of your own, but by his unmerited favor. You did nothing to earn it, and yet God gave it anyway. You see, in order for you and I to be saved, God had to make the first move. He had to meet us at our point of need. He had to, to reach down into the pit of our self-made mess and pull us out of the miry clay, right? God had to do that. God chose to save us and he chose to do so while we were dead in our trespasses and had nothing to offer him. You, you couldn't offer God anything that would merit his salvation. And I want to point out by God's grace, you were saved from some things. You were saved from death eternally. You were saved from hell. You were saved from the separation of God's presence and God's best. But you not, not only were saved from some things, you were also saved for some things. He rescued you from death for a greater purpose, and that was to give us abundant life, yes. 
but it was to give us purpose in this life and so that we could live our life to bring glory to God and show other people the light of Jesus and the difference that he makes. The Bible says, I am saved by grace. But it goes on to say, and I am saved through faith. I am saved through faith. You will never come to Jesus or enter into a saving relationship without faith. See, faith is the step that is required for salvation. The steps of salvation is a step of faith. This is how dead people come alive. And if this is how dead people come alive, I think it's important that we understand what faith really is. See, faith is not a work. It's a response to Christ's work. We get this mixed up sometimes. Sometimes we look at being saved by grace through faith like it was nothing more than a blueprint for salvation, like a process that must be followed. We get this confused, especially in churches today. We think, man, if someone is going to be saved, there's certain steps that you got to take. You got a bunch of do's that you have to do. You got to walk an aisle or you're not getting saved. You have to pray a magic prayer or you're not getting saved. You have to be baptized a certain way or you're not getting saved. You have to tithe your offering. You got to show up at church. You got to read your Bible, have a quiet time, pray before every meal. There's a long list of things that we want to elevate as if it was a part of a process of being saved. But let me tell you this one more time. Faith is not a work. It's our response to Christ's work, which means salvation by grace through faith isn't a formula to follow. It's a miracle to believe and receive. It's through Jesus and Jesus alone. If experiencing salvation were as easy as following a formula, then by us following that formula, it would essentially be us saving ourselves. If I got to do step one, step two, step three, and step four in order to be saved, and that's the whole process, and I'm looking at this thinking, you know what that is? It's nothing more than works. It would be our works and following that formula that saved us. And so that's not what salvation looks like at all. Why? He said, so that no one would boast. If I could save myself, I promise you I would boast about it. I'd be like, prayed the prayer, did the thing, dunked the water, saved myself, boom, what's up, right? I mean, I would be, I would be totally proud of myself if I could just save myself from hell. Guess what? You would too. But because it wasn't designed that way, God gets all the glory. Remember what Paul just, just said. He said, this is not from yourselves. It's God's gift, not from works, so that no one will boast. When a person extends their hand to receive a gift from someone else, they do so with nothing to earn that gift or deserve that gift. If you've ever received a gift from somebody, you know how this works. All the person does is extend their hand by faith in order to receive the gift. And because it's designed that way, after receiving the gift, it's the giver that gets the credit for the gift, not the receiver. Do we get that today? If you've been saved, you've received a gift from God. If you've been saved, it's not just faith that saved you, it's Jesus that saved you. Jesus is the saver in the story of salvation. And because Jesus is the savior, Jesus gets the glory for the gift. I read a story the other day about a 28-year-old man that was choking on a piece of steak. A piece of steak lodged in his, in his airway, and he was panicking because he was all by himself. He, he couldn't save himself. He's looking around trying to do everything he can, but there's, there's no one there to assist. No one there to do the Heimlich maneuver. No one there to perform CPR. No one at all. And so in his panic, he starts to roam around his house and he goes to the room next to the room he was standing in and he finds a medical device, a medical device that is designed to dislodge food from a person's airway. So he puts it on his, on his face and he, he, he does whatever you're supposed to do three different times. And on the third attempt, the medical device worked, the food was dislodged and the man was okay. Now, I'm reading this article, and it caught my attention because the title of the article was Man Saves Himself from Choking. And I read that, and I get what it's trying to say, but I guess it's all a matter of perspective if you think that's true or not. See, the way I see it, the man didn't save himself from choking. It was that medical device that saved the man from choking. 
Without the medical device, this man wouldn't have experienced salvation in that moment. He would have choked and he would have died. See, we get confused when it comes to salvation as well. Listen, you can have faith all day long, but faith isn't what saved you. I meet people all over the world that have faith, faith in all kinds of crazy things. I had conversations this week with people that have faith in the sun, faith in false gods, faith in temples to, to pagan deities. They have faith in crazy things. And let me just say, if you have faith in crazy things, you have a faith in a dead God. And if you have faith in a dead God, you can do that all day long. And you know what you're going to have at the end of the day? You're going to have a dead faith. And yet people all over the world today are living with a dead faith, faith in themselves, faith in their family, faith in tradition, faith in their works, faith in their culture, faith in their denomination. You got all kinds of dead faith out there. And yet people believe somehow that their dead faith at the end of the day is going to lead them to some kind of life. Let me tell you something. That is wrong. It's not going to happen. Faith in and of itself doesn't save you. You know what the Bible says? It's by grace through faith in Jesus that saves you. He is the saver. He's the savior. He alone gets the glory and he alone brings dead people to life. Aren't you grateful for Jesus today? Listen, this book, it tells us that Jesus saved us. Have you ever wondered why? Have you ever wondered why? Why me, God? Here's what the Bible is going to tell us today. That we are saved for a purpose. And that first purpose is this. We are saved to glorify God. Your life as a believer, your life in Christ should bring glory to the name of Jesus. May I ask you a personal question today? Who is getting the glory in your story right now? I really want you to consider this. Because in every single story, there's one person in which the spotlight remains. And we live in a world right now where, where even Christians have a tendency to live in such a way where the spotlight remains us. It's all about us. It's about our kingdom. It's about our personality. It's about our reputation. It's about our life. It's all about us. And yet Paul's going to say, if you are in Christ and Jesus has made you new in him, then the spotlight should remain on Jesus. The Bible says our life and our salvation is ultimately designed to bring glory to God. You're a trophy. And God designed it that way. If you've ever seen a trophy cabinet, then you understand glory. Because a trophy tells the story of glory. Every time you see a trophy, that trophy represents a victory. It represents a winning team. It represents a positive story to tell. It gives glory to something. And in a similar way, our life after salvation is designed to be a trophy of God's grace. I was reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 this morning. It reminds us that God didn't call us he didn't call, what does it say, many wise, many powerful, nor many of noble birth. But instead, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. This is, it goes on to say, he has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. You look at the purpose there. God's purpose in our salvation story it's not just to make us better versions of ourselves. Our salvation isn't primarily about our good. It's primarily about, primarily about his glory so that we might demonstrate, like it says in verse 7, the immeasurable riches of his grace. Show the world who Jesus is. Show the world what Jesus has done for you. You have a new identity because of him. You say, how am I supposed to bring glory to God through my life? I'm just a student or I'm just an employee. I'm just a mom or I'm just a dad. How can I, as a believer... Give glory to God. I'm glad you asked that question because I'm going to give you a couple answers real quick. Here's what the Bible says. I give glory to God by letting my light shine before others. Every time I get to live my faith, I'm, I'm giving glory to Almighty God. I'm going to give glory to God by participating in advancing the gospel, whether that be by giving or going or sharing it with my words. I'm giving glory to God by working unto the Lord in whatever I do. 
It doesn't matter what I'm doing. But if I'm doing it for the glory of God, then I'm putting a smile on the face of Jesus. He said, I'm giving glory to God by giving thanks to him and praise to him. I give glory to God by worshiping him together with other people like we're doing here today. This brings glory to the name of Jesus. We bring glory to God by trusting him and persevering through difficult times and trials. We give glory to God by turning away from sin and turning to Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We give glory to God by serving other people. We give glory to God by bearing fruit, according to John 15. We give glory to God by being generous to the poor and and giving when the Holy Spirit prompts us to give. Ultimately, if you want to wrap all of this up and ask one general question, how can my life bring glory to God this week? You know what I would say? You want to give glory to God? Then live a surrendered life to Jesus and walk by faith in a way that pleases your Father. That's how you bring glory to God. And according to Paul in this passage of scripture, the purpose of your salvation is to bring glory to God. But there's a second reason, and he tells us in verse 10, I am saved for good works. To bring glory to God, yes, but to bring good works to people also. Look at verse 10. Verse 10 says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Now, again, we're not saved because of good works, but the Bible says we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Look at this word for good works. In other words, an an indicator of salvation is the fruit that you bear. Fruit trees bear fruit, period. Fruit trees bear fruit. In fact, let's play a little game. We'll see how much you guys know. An apple tree bears, an orange tree bears, and Christians bear good works. Good works. And that natural, that's a natural thing. You you see, the fruit tells the truth about the tree. And if the tree has no fruit, then you have to ask the question, is it a fruit tree or not? And in the same way, he says good works are the natural fruit of someone who is in a relationship with Jesus. And therefore, if the tree lacks that fruit, you have to ask the question, is it really a Christian tree? Look at what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16. He said, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father in heaven. He didn't say that as if you might have good deeds. No, he's talking to believers and saying, people are going to see your good deeds. And when they do, they're going to glorify your father in heaven. You see, God's design includes good works for one reason. And once again, that is to bring glory to his name. In Titus chapter two, verse seven, Paul told Titus, make yourself an example of good works with integrity and dignity in your teaching. Why? Because those good works going to bring glory to his name. And I think it's interesting to think about the audience in which he was speaking. Was he only telling the missionaries and only telling his contemporaries that that you are going to have good works? Or was he including all of those who are in Christ? The answer is the latter. He included all of us. In fact, in Colossians 3, 17, he's talking to believers and he said, in whatever you do, In word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. If you know Christ, he's talking to you right here. And he's saying, if you're saved, your life should be a living testimony that brings glory to God in whatever you do. What are you doing this week? Do you have some things to do? Of course you do. All of us do. And it may not be uh, going on a mission trip to Egypt or Nepal. It may be to take the trash out or go to school or go on a vacation on fall break, right? I mean, you you can have a whole long list of things that we're going to do. And the Bible says, if you're a believer, then whatever you do, do for the glory of God. You know what that means? If you're a plumber, you better plumb for the glory of God. If you're a teacher, you better teach for the glory of God. If you're a banker, you better bank for the glory of God. If you're a mom or a dad, you better parent in such a way where God receives the glory. You know how you bring glory to God through your life? Jesus says in John 15, 8, my father is glorified by this. Lean in and listen. He said that you produce much fruit 
and prove to be my disciple. He said, the fruit will tell the truth about the tree. See, Jesus saved us for good works and those good works should produce fruit in our life. Sometimes the idea of producing fruit can also be confusing because we look around and we see lost people doing good things all the time. When you look at a lost person that's doing great things, listen, does that mean that that person is safe? It doesn't. Dead people do good things. While you were dead, you did good things. Many of us did, right? But I want you to understand before you know Christ, while you're still dead, anything that you did that was good was ultimately, it was ultimately done as a selfish gesture done in the flesh. It always had a motive. It always had a motive. There's a lot of that happening today. We see spiritually dead people helping other people. You have lost people raising millions, if not billions, to help with hurricane victims. You've got great people, good people, dead people raising their children well, giving money to charities, helping the poor. Just because you do good works, it doesn't mean you're saved. Romans chapter 3 verse 20 says, For no one will be justified in his sight by the works of the law. You know what that says? Good works in and of themselves have never and will never save anyone. But on the flip side of that, the Bible also says, but when someone is actually saved, when they are saved by God, they will receive the spirit of God. They will inherit the nature of God. And the Bible says the natural result of that relationship with him will be good works. Not might be, but will be. And those good works, Paul calls the evidence of being a disciple of Jesus. He said, take note of the good works because those good works are evidence that you are my disciple. There's a lot packed into these 10 verses. But what he told us today was, I am saved by grace through faith to glorify God for good works. So let me end our time together by asking you just a practical question today. As you evaluate your own life, your own heart, your existence on planet earth, may I ask you, does your life give glory to God? Who's in the spotlight of your story? And as you continue to evaluate your own story, I mean, is your life producing good works as a result of the relationship that you have with Jesus? And are those good works pointing people to him? as our hope for salvation and life. Perhaps the question I should be asking is, is this, have you truly been saved? Can you point to a time in your life where you experience what it's like to go from death to life? Have you been saved by grace through faith? Has God canceled who you were and given you new life in him? Do you know today that you've been forgiven of your sin, that, that your name has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that you have a reservation, your bags are packed and you're ready to go? You see, God gives us the ability to know that we're in a relationship with him. He even gives us evidence of that relationship, that we can see tangible evidence that results from him. And yet, if you don't have that evidence today and you are, are left wondering with a question mark what your eternal destination is going to look like, I believe God gives us moments like these where we can do business with him, where he meets us at our point of need. He reaches down into our self-made mess. He pulls us out of the miry clay and does what only he can do. Listen, has God saved you today? If not, would you consider going all in with Jesus right now? In fact, why don't you just bow your heads and close your eyes? I don't know your story. I don't know where you're at with the Lord. But in a room like this, in a crowd this size, there has to be one person that right now would say, Pastor, I know that I've been in church and I've done good things, but I also know that I've never really had a transformative moment with God that's changed my everything. Maybe God is a subject in school to you. Maybe, maybe God is, is a figure in a great book that you've been reading off and on throughout your life. Maybe God is a part of your life, but you've never made Jesus your life. You've never given him everything. Man, I invite you to do that today. Jesus doesn't want to be Lord over a portion of your life. He doesn't want to be your weekend boyfriend. 
Jesus wants you to go all in with him and trust him, not only with your life on planet earth, but for your eternity. And the people in this room and people all around the world today are going to either accept Jesus fully or they're going to reject him completely. And so I say, if you're anywhere in between, would you consider praying to ask Jesus to save you today? There's not a person in this room that he refuses to save. He comes to us and meets us while we're still sinners. He doesn't say, you need to do this and this and this and clean your life up and then we'll talk about salvation. He said, I can save you right now if you're willing to go all in with me. So if you're here today and unashamedly would like to say yes to Christ, would you just pray this and say, Jesus, I need you. I need you because I can't save myself. So Jesus, I'm asking you to save me. In this moment and for the rest of my life, I turn away from my sin. I don't want to live like a dead person any longer. I turn away from sin and I turn to you as my Savior and my Lord. I believe you are who you say you are. I believe you died on a cross. I believe you rose from the grave. I believe that you're alive today. And God, now I'm asking you to step into my life and to give me life. Make me a new person. God, give me the desire to live for you and to follow you all the days of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. May I never be ashamed of this decision. May I let my light shine before men so that you may be glorified. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hi, I'm Jordan Easley, Senior Pastor of First Baptist Cleveland and also host of All In, where I have the privilege and the joy of sharing Bible teachings with you every single week right from the Word of God. I'd also like to take a moment and just invite you to sign up right now for my free daily devotional email. Uh, That email is sent out every single morning and is designed to help you begin each day refreshed and inspired. The information needed to register for this free daily devotional email is showing up on the screen right now. So please sign up and look for your first email to arrive first thing tomorrow morning. Hey, thank you for connecting with me today. And please know that you are such a blessing to us as we strive together to live a life all in for Jesus Christ. This episode of All In with Pastor Jordan Easley has been made possible by the generous support of viewers like you. We hope and pray for God to speak to you today as you seek to live your life all in for Jesus Christ.